Hello again, I'm Steve Plaitch, and welcome to this edition of Nonprofit Spotlight. As you know, Nonprofit Spotlight is a production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at Community Television. And every program, we highlight one of the nonprofits in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County, doing wonderful, wonderful work. And this program, we're really delighted to have with us uh, Ray Cancino, the CEO of Community Bridges, and Amy Hanley, who is the Marketing Communications Manager of Community Bridges. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for having us, Steve. We yeah, most thank you. Thank you. yeah, welcome. Great to have you. Uh, most folks really know uh, uh, something about the great work that Community Bridges uh, does so comprehensively working through Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County. But for those who don't know uh, as much about uh, yourselves, uh, Amy, why don't you start tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be working with uh, Community Bridges? Sure. Um, I started my career in, kind of in the for-profit world, uh, doing uh, corporate uh, uh, survey management and marketing and communications, and did a mid, mid-career shift to look um, and started following my passion and started really wanting to connect with my community and was very fortunate um, to work for a nonprofit health plan for a number of years as well as working in the community as part of Physicians Medical Group when that before it uh, merged in with Dignity Health, um, you know, working with the community and communications there. Um, and then had the opportunity um, about a year and a half ago to join the Community Bridges team as the Marketing and Communications mm-hmm. Manager and just knew so much about the work that Community Bridges was doing in the community um, and their commitment to really serving those um, underserved and in areas that are pe- with people that are often forgotten. So it was very um, exciting to be able to join them and just really believe in their mission and how we're really able to impact people from the very youngest in our community to the very oldest. I don't think there's any organization that really has the reach that we do. So that was really one of the great appeals for being part of this organization. Well, it's wonderful to have such a rich and varied background and and welcome to our community. And I'm certain that uh, Community Bridges uh, prizes your participation highly, no doubt. Uh, Ray, you've been uh, CEO of Community Bridges uh, for some time, uh, really well known throughout the community. But uh, but tell folks just a little bit about uh, your background and how you came to uh, Community Bridges. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Yeah, I've been I've been a CEO now, going to be seven years uh, at the end of uh, December. My goodness! And uh, you know, been been really uh, working in nonprofits uh, the majority of my career. Um, did a little stint in uh, doing some research uh, and development with uh, San Francisco State University, mm-hmm. um, but um, very little time. Most of it had been in the nonprofit world, and I uh, spent uh, the majority of time before coming and joining Community Bridges at Catholic Charities in San Francisco. Uh, running and managing uh, emerging emergency shelters for families, as well as transitional housing uh, for uh, seniors and for families. So ran the two largest uh, complexes in San Francisco uh, with a total of over 236 households um, and thousands of people living in Edith Witt and 10th and Mission, uh, which was a basically a mixed income uh, housing unit um, in partnership with uh, Mercy Housing. So my background has always been about operations and management of social services and implementing it with community members and working with um, a variety of uh, income levels and providing services and needs uh, and specifically working with also um, our houseless folks as well. So. I did not know that. That's interesting. As you know, I do uh, work with our local uh, shelters here, so I've been involved in that for some time. So fascinating. That's terrific. Uh, most of these programs uh, recently on uh, Nonprofit Spotlight have focused on uh, the challenges of pursuing a mission that is sometimes very uh, community interactive in an age when we are sheltering in place and we have social distancing and COVID-19 protocols. Uh, Amy, uh, how has that affected your ability to pursue the mission within those protocols? I would say for almost all of our programs, it presented some really uh, steep challenges at the beginning of of the COVID-19 shelter in place. Um, Most of our programs have congregate group activities that they um, rely on. Uh, For example, Meals on Wheels had multiple dining sites throughout the county where seniors would gather um, to be able to share a meal and conversation. 
And obviously those were shut down. So not only did it play a role in um, the increase of home delivered meals, which has increased 90% since March, the number of seniors that are now needing their home delivery, um, but it also has taken away a lot of their, um, you know, their ability to socialize and they're very, you know, many seniors are very isolated at home. Mm-hmm. So that's impacted our, um, our seniors, um, specifically also our Elder Day program, because that's a congregate site where seniors um, and people with disabilities um, and often have very complex medical conditions would come to spend the day. Um, so that program was actually was uh, had to pivot extremely to be able to provide those services at home. Um, and we've also developed some new programs to help seniors um, kind of keep that sense of connection both to their community and to their peers. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's also helped us to really kind of create new opportunities as well. Um, and then also our family resource centers, which we have four centers throughout the county um, that provide a, usually provide a lot of um, community support with parenting education, digital literacy education, um, you know, a lot of group activities um, that had to be put on hold and that it's taking, you know, it can take some time to transition those into a virtual program and often those don't reach all the same, the amount of people that it can reach by in person. So we've been challenged by um, by that as well, um, and we've certainly seen you know huge increases in um, people coming to our resource centers for support during this time for unemployment assistance, helping them to access public benefits after they've lost wages. Um, and again, we've really been able to pull together new programs where we have. Um, so we've received funds from various foundations and huge support from the community to allow us to provide grocery gift cards to families. Um, we've re- revamped our food distribution. So they come, they're all uh, through vehicles and they come through. You know, we definitely had to increase the number of and the hours for our food distributions across the county as we saw so many people come through many of whom who had never needed our services before and suddenly they find themselves in a situation where they need some extra help with food um so we were you know very fortunate that we were able to expand those services to yeah. meet that need that's wonderful and uh, so many of the nonprofit folks that we've talked to uh during these programs have said that uh, the COVID-19 uh, restrictions have created additional opportunities that weren't heretofore you know presented uh Ray mm-hmm. you're kind of the face of the franchise you're out in the community a lot people know you uh you're a great ambassador for community vision community bridges how's that kind of affected your ability to do your job uh within uh, the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions well, I mean, a lot, we're doing a lot of Zoom meetings and staying connected with both yeah, electives yeah. and individuals. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that I, I, I try to live the mission and every that's kind of one thing I try to instill uh, in everyone that works with us and, and um, you know, provides this work is that you have to be out there and you have to lead by example. And so, you know, I think that what it, it has allowed me to do is actually get back into uh, direct service a little bit more, actually, because... Um, there has been such a, a fear around COVID and, and some of our staff, um, you know, have chosen to retire or, or not mm-hmm. return to work. You know, we've had to kind of use all resources. And so, you know, um, I've had to be out there to step in uh, at doing some direct services um, just to make sure that the services continue. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's about just creative problem solving as much as we can. So we do do a lot more meetings via Zoom and stay connected via Zoom um, and uh, telephone meetings and and just staying in constant communications, having standing meetings as well. So we have a a morning meeting on Friday mornings with all my team about like latest updates to the fire, latest updates to COVID, making sure everyone's aware of the resources, um, planning and coordinating kind of response to to our to our community needs. So. Um, you know, just it's increased the amount of work for us um, in order to us to, to stay communicating and to stay connected with one another. Um, but it's also provided opportunity for us to kind of get out there uh, for those folks that, um, you know, are able to still contribute in, in that way. Um, obviously, with new restrictions and obviously with the with with more hurdles. Uh, but once you solve for those things. Uh, you end up kind of uh, reassuring everybody else and uh, showing everyone else that you can do direct service work in the in the age of COVID. Uh, you just have to take extra precautions, you know. 
Interesting. I think you're so right. And uh, for a person like myself, for instance, who works with uh, some nonprofits as well, it's the steep learning curve for me, you know, to do Zoom and yet be able to go out and talk to people and take advantage of what opportunities you have to really pursue the various missions and stuff. Um, I wanted to talk to both of you about uh, uh, the CZU Lightning Complex uh, fire and all the great work you're doing. Uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier, as we always mentioned, this program will be evergreen, so we'll play this throughout the year as well as being in our upcoming playlist. But it's really worth discussing the wonderful, wonderful work you're doing for the evacuees and the research you're providing. So Amy, uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about that? Maybe Ray, you can add something if you like. Yes, uh, from from the beginning of the of the fires, you know, really community bridges staff were uh, were on the front lines. You know, Ray was up there in Felton right away mm -hmm. um, with our Mountain Community Resources Center there, which is really the center of, of social services in the valley. Um, and so our program director and Ray immediately started triaging people that were coming in that were confused. They weren't sure what was happening, um, and so really providing them with the information they needed to um, act safely during that fire was really key. Um, and one of the things and Ray can expand on that he talked about is in that kind of crisis time, it was really important to have that one-on-one -on -one contact. Mm -hmm. You know, people might, you know, they would have a phone, they weren't sure where to go. They, you know, there was a lot of information and a lot of confusion. And so being able to have that trusted um, place to go in Mountain Community Resources, and staff there to answer their questions um, was really helpful. So they really helped, we really helped triage people during that initial phase um, as evacuations were starting. Um, and then we had a huge number of our staff that did an excellent job throughout that whole weekend of going to the evacuation centers, of going to different areas in the community where people were gathering and uncertain, like in Scotts Valley when they didn't know where to go, to again, triaging people. So really that disseminating of information um, I think we we were able to rally a, a team of our staff to do, as well as providing su definite supplies, um, specific supplies to the evacuation center, like hygiene kits um, and pr pr protective equipment and hand sanitizers and things to help keep people be safe there. And Ray, your observations about uh, this terrific work is a really comprehensive work that you have done and continue to do with the CZU Lichen Fire. Yeah, I, I just would like to kind of commend uh, my coworkers, especially Amy, who um, kind of helped transition that. I think she she pointed to one major aspect, which was uh, the information was coming from uh, multiple uh, resources, and there wasn't a place to kind of coalesce it um, until later on when the county was able to get their website up. Um, but we were able to coalesce that information. Amy was providing uh, two updates a day, a morning update and a night update uh, to provide people evacuation maps and new areas of where evacuation was happening to help coordinate and triage people into both the Red Cross and the county shelters. So a lot of people didn't realize that there are two separate entities that were setting up shelters and then coordinating. Um, and they all ended up being under command of the county and now, you know, are going back to the Red Cross. Uh, so, you know, I think it was a, a, also an opportunity for us to uh, partner with other organizations and make sure that uh, we were kind of working together and hand in hand we had also churches setting up uh, evacuation sites and working with them and getting information about what were their needs. Uh, so we had a lot of resources, you know, Mountain Community Resources, um, you know, helps a lot of folks, including our houseless folks up in the valley. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we had is we had, uh, you know, tents and sleeping bags. And that was one of the first things that ended up being the need. And so we were able to use our current stock, order new stock and get those things into Emmeline. And then once at Emmeline, we saw the need for volunteers we stepped in there as well. Uh, so I think that what we saw was just kind of uh, identifying by being out in the community, identifying where the needs uh, were happening on the ground and then trying to respond and coordinate with other uh, county partners to do so. So, uh, you know, my, the, the coworkers that I, that I work with, uh, you know, are um, all doing this because of the mission and, and they all kind of dedicated their time on the weekend and, and stepped in to to help do that and, and be proactive about it. You know, we also targeted the Poconip um, because there was a fear that um, the line would, you know, potentially uh, come down uh, UCSC, down the hill uh, in the open area. And so that would have been the next fire break. And we wanted to make sure that our houseless folks that didn't have cell phones, uh, might, weren't following the radio, um, weren't being communicated to, 
were at least aware about the evacuations, the air quality issues, uh, providing enough PPE for them uh, to stay safe out in uh, in the elements. And so um, just communicating, we hiked the Poconip uh, both Thursday and Friday, just to make sure people were aware when we were thinking that the fire uh, could come down. So our job was trying to triage people to get them to the evacuation sites as soon as possible uh, to get them kind of safe and then uh, to help support the evacuation centers as best as we could by providing any uh, materials that uh, weren't being uh, dropped off by the county at that point in time or, or were on their way, but they needed them right then and there. And so that was, I think, uh, our, our, our biggest push. And then now we're transitioning, obviously, to setting up the recovery effort. Um, mm -hmm. And so this week, you know, Mountain Community Resource Center, you know, opened up the first day, which is Monday, uh, after the evacuation centers were open. Uh, and are now kind of processing and helping families apply for FEMA, apply for the state uh, hotel voucher, um, helping a family through rental assistance. So if you qualify if your home was damaged, um, you know, you will qualify for a rental assistance grant that we have. We have grocery cards, uh, assistance for those folks that were evacuated. And then um, for those folks that need uh, support, uh, we also have laundry service. Um, so we are partnering with a company out of Scotts Valley and just wanted to thank the owner um, of uh, Bubbles Laundry that is helping us out. Uh, so we, we are we are providing those services uh, directly through our all our family resource centers. So not just Mountain Community Resource Centers, but any one uh, of the family resource centers. People can access these resources and uh, go through the application process and we'll get them set up. And so uh, we've now transitioned into that step of it, into the long-term recovery effort. Um, and that's kind of how we're going to be uh, providing that next uh, level of support for families. Well, it's interesting, and your assistance has been so comprehensive that people don't realize that one of the major needs during an emergent situation is communication. People don't want to feel isolated. They want to know what's going on and then be able to give them enough information so they'll know where to go to get some materials and eventually where they'll be able to go uh, to help in the recovery. I saw the big uh, FEMA uh, van down by the, uh, the uh, downtown tent and uh, there are lots of folks down there getting through the recovery process. Are you involved with that effort down there as well? Yeah, so we're in communications with them, um, for sure. We, we are definitely uh, wanting people to, you know, do as much as online because of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and they, they've set up a website, uh, but people can uh, set up appointments there. Uh, we are definitely in support and working with uh, both county parks, uh, who's uh, helping manage the, uh, the uh, evacuation recovery center uh, mm -hmm. and also rosemary of the oes and so we are in contact with them uh, we are we're in a very unique situation where um you know because of our staffing unfortunately we have to make tough decisions between opening our centers or uh pitching and helping support at the evacuation uh center just because we just don't have enough staff at this point in time we're working on that staff capacity piece as fast as possible uh, and so we hope to get staff actually to the evacuation center but right now, unfortunately, we just haven't been able to hire uh, and, and replace some of the folks that have left us recently uh, fast enough in order to, to be able to do that. So our goal is to, to have some presence there. Uh, right now, we're working uh, with the um, operators there just to make sure that our information is available and maybe even training some volunteers that are going to be staffing the recovery center uh, about how they can access some of our resources that um, are generously donated through our community foundation and other partners, um, lots of foundations to try to get access and resources to families that are eligible. And Amy, uh, as Ray was saying, you were doing the briefings early on and as communications manager for Community Bridges, uh, how, what is your role now in the, in the CZU Lightning Complex kind of recovery process? In the recovery process, my role is really to get the word out to our community that these resources are available, you know, that we are still here, that we're open, um, and just really letting people know that those resources are available. So again, it's through really any channels that we have through our social media, um, through our website, through working, you know, connecting with partners, as Ray talked about. Um, really um, ensuring that the community knows that pe that we have assistance for them and that we're here. 
Yeah. And uh, we were talking earlier, uh, we've done programs in the past uh, featuring Elder Day, featuring Liftline, featuring your, your wonderful many programs. We don't have time, unfortunately, to go through all of them. We'd be here all day and actually it'd be a day well spent as far as I'm concerned. But uh, you were mentioning uh, something about uh, the ability uh, to staff and to be able to keep ongoing programs uh, staffed and functional uh now how is that affecting uh, your children's programs your family programs your senior programs the ones that you are you know really known for and have been doing for many 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 years right yeah so uh we've been doing a lot of creative things and i'll, I'll run through some of the the, please, the please. major the major issues so for for the children's program we are uh, be able to keep staffing up unfortunately um, because of the state order we're limited in how many children we could serve. So we actually have an abundance of teachers. Um, it's not that we don't ha don't have enough staff, it's just that we don't have the right staff to do certain jobs. So um, so for instance, if the teachers, they're they're fine. The, the, the CDD programs had to close down a couple of days due to the evacuation centers. We have two programs in the mountains, one at Highlands Park and uh, one at San Lorenzo High School, Redwood mm -hmm. Mountain. And so um, we had to close those centers down for a couple of days due to the fire and due to the air quality. Uh, they're back in, you know, they're back and running. Um, you know, Redwood uh, Mountain will start opening up uh, new uh, slots in the next coming weeks, and then Highlands Park will be will be open uh, uh, is open again, and, and there is a couple slots available because the the state requires that they be quote unquote stable uh, stable groups. Um, you know, there's limited amount of people that we can actually serve. So it's only 10 per room, essentially. And uh, th that includes one teacher. So the maximum that could be is 12 people. So mm -hmm. we have an on-call person, a regular teacher, and one teacher per classroom. Um, and then the ratio has to be, of course, one to eight. So there, there's there's kind of one of those things that we, that we only accept 10, but they can only eight can show up a day. Uh, and so... And so it gets really complicated to be both compliant with COVID, um, but those are the types of things we're doing. Um, at Meals on Wheels, we continue to serve, obviously, like Amy says, we've uh, increased over 90%, and we're anticipating another growth of another 90 to 100% uh, once the Great Plates program, which is the federal funded uh, state program uh, that um, is currently serving some seniors, uh, goes away or the funding ends, we know that those seniors will probably end up uh, joining Meals on Wheels. And so we're kind of building capacity for that transition. Um, and then as far as uh, Elder Day, we continue to, to obviously serve, but we serve people differently. So we're doing a lot of what we call doorstep uh, medical uh, engagements. Yeah. So we're actually sending our nurses and our LVNs to the people's homes. Uh, we're sending uh, activity packs to people's homes. And, and one thing I would wanna share with everybody that's watching today or watching it in the future is to join us on uh, Senior Center Without Limits. And so it's a program that we started in collaboration with our county parks department, um, as well as all the city uh, parks department and uh, Watsonville Parks Department uh, to basically do a virtual senior center. So we have free programming for seniors seven, uh, five days a week. And um, there's about seven to 10 activities a day uh, from yoga to Qigong to art classes to English language learner classes to meditation. Uh, we, we have a lot of variety to try to keep seniors connected. And on top of that, we've been able to raise um, funds to donate and to give low income seniors uh, the technology. So we're handing out and giving people uh, Amazon Fire. All we're asking is a handshake deal that you'll actually participate and use it to stay engaged. We'll teach you how to use it. Uh, we have also um, some great partnerships to help uh, tech support uh, with seniors. Um, you can also call in if you don't want to use your computer uh, to these programs and services, uh, as well as we're helping people one-on-one -on -one getting connected to the internet. So we understand that it's not just having the technology, it's knowing how to use it. It's also yeah. having the internet to use it, uh, yeah. as well as having the programming. And so that's something that we want to make sure people are aware of. Um, because it's a free resource, uh, and that's thanks to the city of Santa Cruz, who um, generously donated uh, CDBG dollars or allocated CDBG dollars to help us uh, launch this program. And at this point, we've had over 820 seniors uh, join uh, yeah. these these different activities uh, and are kind of getting engaged and starting their own community. And so that's kind of one way that we're trying to solve for that isolation issue. 
And it's interesting to me that, again, the shows that we've done, so many of the nonprofits have talked about uh, virtual teaching or virtual engagement. So we're all kind of on this learning curve about, you know, how to really use the technology more. And I would uh, hasten to mention that anybody who wants to know more about uh, Community Bridges, uh, we can't cover it all today, regrettably, uh, communitybridges.org, your wonderful website, has just all the information you really need uh, and want. And uh, of course, I'm certain that community bridges, like uh, other nonprofits, they need money to make <laughs> their programs work. Uh, it doesn't happen in a vacuum, so donations, I'm certain, uh, are also uh, welcome as well. We have uh, just a couple more minutes here, uh, actually two or three. Uh, Amy, how is the uh, the fire and uh, sheltering in place and the, the, the things that we are experiencing now, the challenges affecting your the marketing communications manager? for community bridges. How is that really affecting your ability as we kind of go forward through the pandemic and, and get more into recovery mode for people who are victims of fire? I think in some ways it's made communications um, a bit more effective and that people are at home, people are on their computers, people may be on their social media more or checking their email. Um, so we have had a lot of engagement um, with the community, you know, via those electronic methods, which has been really great. Um, I think it's um, also, we've also been seen as a, um, an, a leader and somebody that can, you can go to for a, as a trusted resource during this time as we've really tried to keep the community update, updated, not just with the fire, which definitely we did that, but also with COVID and really trying to provide some supportive, um, supportive resources through our communications for the community. So I think that's been a really great um, thing that's happened through COVID. And the other, the other piece that we've, we've had is we, we, you know, we've definitely had our community step up and support us through, um, you know, financially through this time. And the community foundation has been a great supporter. So we've been able to really yeah. meet needs that have arisen. Um, but we we did also have to cancel all of our in-person fundraising for this year. So we've also had to work on different communications and different ways to do that. So we are um, we're launching our first online fundraiser or an auction um, in the next week on September 19th through the 27th. So we're trying again to find different ways of communications, different ways of fundraising to meet these new challenges. Yeah. And uh, regrettably, uh, we're going to be out of time here in a minute. Uh, we'll have you folks back so we can talk about many, many more of the programs you're offering. Always Community Bridges, a community partner, a community leader. I'm glad that we were able to mention some of the great work you're doing. Uh, again, great to see you, Ray Cancino, the CEO of Community Bridges, and Amy Hanley, who is the Marketing Communications Manager. Thanks so much for being here, for sharing with the community, and for really stepping up at a time when uh, our community really needs the great work that Community Bridges has done and continues to do. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. And we will see you both very, very soon. Keep up the great, great work. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah, I've been Steve Plach. And join us next time for another nonprofit spotlight. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.